Hey everybody, how you doing? It's Mark Ross. It is, oh my gosh, it's June 19th, Monday. I'm here with Tracy McDonald. Tracy, how are you? Where are we finding you today? Uh, bonjour from Libreville, Gabon, Central Bonjour, West Africa. mademoiselle. <laughs> Perfect. Oh, mais très bien, vous parlez bien. <laughs> um, pour, um, pour, um, pour, um, pour. <laughs> So Tracy's joining us. Um, I think this might be the first international, well, certainly the first call to Africa on ITK Radio, which is really great. Um, Tracy, what I find interesting, she's a background in counterterrorism, working at Treasury, uh, you know, trying to find the bad guys, um, also fraud, banking, and now she's a creative writing expert. Oh my gosh, what a transition. I love it. What do we need to know about that? Oh, there's a lot. That, that's a, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, yeah, I just, you want the quick timeline? I started out nope. in Columbus, Georgia. I'm a Southerner. Oh my gosh, Columbus, Georgia. I've been there. I think there's, uh, have I been there? No. It's, is it off I-75? Am I correct? Or no? Yeah, it's a couple hours south of Atlanta. It's mainly known for Fort Benning. It's where all the infantry goes for the Army. Amazing. Wow. So yeah, you grew up in the so south, started, and then how did you? Yeah, how did you make your way to DC or the nation's, you know, kind of na national politics and national security? Yeah, very interesting. I think it's a path that I couldn't have known or carved out for myself. Um, I started out with a credit card processor in my hometown after college, and got into the fraud transactions piece of that company. Uh, got sent, sent very young as an expat to work in London. So I was always in conversations with banks about trying to improve their fraud software and how to identify fraud. And then 9-11 happened and I really wanted to be a part of something bigger. And I met some Secret Service agents that came to that credit card processor to look at the Bank of America accounts that the hijackers had used. And they said, we need women. Would you like to apply? And I did. And I became a federal agent. I did a short stint in the Atlanta field office. And it was fascinating. But I realized I wanted my uh, corporate hours and corporate pay. And I got back <laughs> into the private sector. But I used that clearance when I got up to Washington, D.C. to get into federal government contracting. That's super interesting. Uh, yeah, I think, well, Let's talk about, because I don't think a lot of people know, the Secret Service is actually under the auspices of the Department of Treasury. And can you kind of just talk about, so the tr Secret Service not only does, obviously, protecting principals, the POTUS, and all the important people in the government, also diplomats, um, but they also have a heavy history around banking and fraud protection. Well, that's exactly right. They were an institution that started to protect our currency. They didn't add the protection piece until McKinley was shot. So a lot of people don't realize that really their bread and butter is white, white collar crime. And what's the genesis of, I mean, just around fraud in general. I mean, it's like if you're a bad person, a bad guy, you're running a bad operation. I mean, ultimately, it's like even if you make these illicit funds, it's like how do you get them into the system? How do you pay for your operations? I mean, really the money, the, ca the currency is the key, I suppose, to most of these criminal operations. Absolutely, it's all about following the money and you need to know the source and the destination, whether it's through the formal banking channels or the informal channels like cash couriers, hawaladars, money service businesses, you know, like your Western unions where they're making smaller amounts. Um, structuring we call it in the money laundering vernacular so it's really with cryptocurrency and digital currency that is changing what this looks like a little bit but i think in many of the countries that are still cash based um it's still very much the old formula of um, cash couriers and moving money across borders and when you're in that kind of work is it almost like putting a puzzle together. I mean, is it really mapping and just kind of peeling back the onion, so to speak? I mean, is that really the key? I mean. Yes, there are several keys. Um, definitely it is like connecting a puzzle, but now you've got uh, Intel sharing, which is really important. That wasn't happening a lot. We learned right before 9-11. And now right. there's a lot of private public partnerships between government and financial institutions, government 
law enforcement and financial institutions, um, and even within the intelligence community, as you know, in, in the DC area, treasury, working with the military, you know, everyone's starting to understand the real benefits of layering all of that information to help connect the puzzle because everybody has a little section that they can see. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I think around like cybersecurity, for example, um, you know, there's been a lot more at least public private partnership or businesses coming forward and saying we've had a breach or sharing information with government agencies. And I suppose the same thing is happening around fraud and money laundering. There, there has to be a much more, a lot more communication from all these various shareholders and stakeholders. Yes. And a huge benefit that's happened really probably only in the last 10 years is that policy is catching up to financial crime. Um, you know, you sell a gram of Coke, you go away for quite a long time and you steal a platinum credit card and, you know, launder money and steal Land Rovers using some doctor's credit card that doesn't know it's missing. And it used to be that in a few months and a slap on the wrist, they got out of prison. But I think financial crimes, finally, the punishment is catching up where it's not as lucrative for the criminals. And the crypto stuff, I mean, it is interesting because as like an entrepreneur or, you know, I have a tendency to, you know, be a bit more free market. Like it sounds great, you know, crypto, decentralized <laughs> currency, you know, the premise of it, you know, moving money quickly, you know, less transaction fees, et cetera. And then you read stories in the journal last week. I don't know if you saw Tracy, but, you know, the U.S. government believes that the North Koreans have stole close to $3 billion worth of crypto, which has gone directly into their, you know, weapons program, their nuclear program. And stuff like that is not great at all. And this, oh gosh, no. the friction between like, you know, um, entrepreneurship, but also governing and keeping the world safe. It's got to be a lot of friction. I'm sure you've seen on your end too. Absolutely. Well, and just the lack of transparency, you know, you have a lot of countries still, um, especially developing nations like this, where even though it's a, it's a republic and a, and a democracy, it's not like an American democracy, and there's not a lot of transparency of money moving in and out of the country, or accountability, for example, of the capital flight leaving from the airports, being driven across borders. Uh, we have a lot better handle on that because we have the resources to track that and to know what to look for to have the training um, in the United States. So let's talk about, yeah, you're, I, before we got on the call, I was saying, I would think like, you know, trying to understand the criminal network, you got to be, you have to be creative. You have to like figure out, you know, how are these dodgy people moving and running around and now, but you're also a very creative person. You know, you have a world of, you're helping people around creative writing and whatnot and um, letting them be more expressive. Can you talk about that transition um, from the, I don't know, so the criminal world to the artistic world? <laughs> Sure. I think it, it all applies, right? It's just uh, taking one skill set and, and kind of reshaping it like clay into, into a different form. Um, absolutely. I think connecting the puzzle pieces of an investigation is very much like connecting the pieces in a novel. I love taking a fiction plot and figuring out a thread that I want to weave from, from the beginning all the way to the end. Um, it's, it's very much like an investigation, sort of. Um, even if you're not writing suspense or mystery in your fiction novel, it's very much figuring out how to put the pieces together cohesively to get the bigger picture. Have you always been creative, so to speak? I mean, was there a part of you, like when you were younger, you know, you're like more of a free spirit, so to speak, and then, you know, I'm just maybe I'm speaking for myself. As you become an adult, you're like, okay, I gotta be, you know, serious. I mean, there's a period I was really keen to go to art school, but I wasn't good enough. And you know, uh, they were like, you should challenge your energy elsewhere. But I still like to think of myself as creative. And I <laughs> like wrestling with that, being a professional versus being creative, or even if it's not your full time job. Can you talk about helping people or encouraging that? Absolutely, it's something that I really tapped back into the past 12 years. I had worked since high school. Um, I turned 50 this year, I don't mind saying. Love and it. thanks. I was 
Chuck E. Cheese the mouse in high school trying to make money, you know, For before real? I got into banking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> My God, that's a whole, that's a whole other pod. That's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. No, no. Like I wore the costume and I was too small. It was smelly. I couldn't see through the eyes. Anyway, yeah, that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> but um, I had worked from high school until 12 years ago, really full time. And we got to our first post in East Africa and Swaziland, which is now renamed Eswatini and um, governed by King Mswati III. Beautiful, beautiful country. But literally, my husband went off to work. I had a new baby. And here I was in the middle of the forest, really lost. And so I got back into creative pursuits that I had not touched since college. So I picked up my camera, I got back into photography. Um, the few art supplies I had with me, I ripped up magazines and got really back into mixed media collage. And you know, it's sort of like, I'm sure how people found themselves and found facets of their personality, maybe they hadn't in a long time when COVID lockdown happened. When you're put in a situation where there's not a lot of outside stimulus, then you kind of go inward. And I think you you tap into that creativity. That's why I started writing. I started freelancing and, and, and journaling more and just trying to figure out how to become fulfilled when I didn't have work any longer to define me. Work as I knew it with a paycheck. No, that is like, yeah, so just sterling insight because, um, well, as you know, in DC, it's like the first question is always like, who do you work for? Or what do you do? And which is a, you know, completely bizarre way to live. Um, Cause we're so defined by the title or you probably know this too, Tracy, like we've had friends that have these really hot shot jobs and then they leave and maybe they got to redefine themselves. So they're starting their own firm and, you know, um, people aren't calling and you're like, yeah, they were only calling you cause you had this important title or this job. But, um, but the creative side is so important. I mean, just, the ability to go to a museum or take photos, you know, experiencing the health benefits. I mean, there's been so much writing about this just around, you know, um, the benefits of awe or being in a forest and whatnot. Um, yeah. How do you, I mean, do you, are you working with folks now to really push them through and say, you know, get out there, do some stuff, even if it's not that great, just be more creative. So quote, unquote. Yes, yes, especially within our expat bubble here um, with the embassy community. We're fortunate that as soon as you move here, you're introduced to a lot of other people with the United Nations and the European Union and the embassy, where we all sort of, not that we have a hive mentality, but most of us sort of go to the same grocery store and the rest, same restaurants because we live in the same area. And it's like a little village. And especially for, you know, spouses, that have never lived overseas before. And it's daunting, right, to get out there. And it's not the same as waking up in the States where you know where to go to the dry cleaners and where to get groceries. And maybe you here you have to go to a market. And if you don't speak the language, it's really, it can be a barrier. Um, but just encouraging people to get out and get to know people in the community and get to know the country and its cultures is fascinating. And you were talking about you know, wonderment, I think as an adult, I feel so fortunate. It's one of the things I love most about living overseas is that, you know, you go on safari and you feel feelings that you haven't felt since you were a child while you're waiting for this elephant to break through the bush or you hear something rustling in the jungle and in the forest and, you know, everyone's holding their breath and the guide saying, be quiet, you know, like no voices. And then suddenly this chimpanzee swings across or this giraffe is just towering over the, the small dirt road that you're on and it's breathtaking. And I love that. And I think that's what travel does. I wish study abroad programs were mandatory for all Americans. And I know not everyone can afford it, but if it were part of a scholarship program or something that our government could support, because you learn so much about America by being outside of it uh yeah 100 percent. like we should work maybe that's a project we can work on i totally agree like get a passport see the world um can you talk about your experience obviously um you're professional you know well-educated you've done some really interesting stuff and then you become um part of the expat community 
you have a spouse who has, you know, part of the diplomatic corps and then wrestling with that, like your role trying to figure out, and then I guess helping others, like you said, like as you get dropped off in these exotic locations or even a foreign post whatsoever, um, the community. And then the third point is like, how do you wrestle with like, Hey, I really want to explore, but you know, the U S government saying, you know, we'd rather you not, so to speak, because of security or whatever reasons. Um, can you just talk about that kind of life overall? That was a, that was a very long sure, running I'm, question. Sorry. No, no, I'm with you. I'm with you. And I'm laughing. You can answer any part husband. of that you want. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I, uh, it's very humbling, uh, being the wife of the man who runs security for the embassy. That's my husband's job is he runs security. And, uh, we were in Egypt while we were there, CC was in power and the Muslim Brotherhood had been eradicated by him or mostly. And so they were retaliating and there were a lot of bombings when we lived in Egypt. Um, this was like 2014 to 17, I think. Right. And really, we were not supposed to be out downtown a lot, you know, during certain times. And. I did have a driver because I didn't speak Arabic and I wanted to go into the Kanal Khalili market and the labyrinthine markets and back alleys that were in areas that were not deemed to be terribly safe at the time. And uh, my husband kept calling me saying, look, you're going to get me in trouble. You're in these zones that we're not <laughs> supposed to be in. And I keep getting phone calls like to reel your wife in. And my husband said, have you met my wife? You know, I'm probably, um, I do try to be diplomatic, but uh, I'm definitely not one to let fear stop me from doing things. And that can be good and bad. I think I see a lot of the countries that we're in, a lot of places in those countries that a lot of other Americans might not feel comfortable going. And I try not to get others to hop with me on that bandwagon until I've checked it out because I don't want to endanger anyone else. But um, I'm very much like, Carpe diem. We're here. I want to see it. I want to be, I don't want to live in just the expat bubble. I want to know the culture. I want to know what the natives know about this culture. Yeah. And I was going to like, with you, you've been doing more writing magazine, the blog and uh, the photography. Um, but are there, are there other, not that those are small projects, but do you have a big collective project that you're working on? Or have you thought about compiling this for lack of a better word into like a book or some kind of like a bigger one piece of content, like a documentary? I mean, is that bubbling in your mind? Yeah, not not film so much. Um, the, documentar the documentary piece, I don't know a lot about that, but I for sure would like to do a coffee table book. I've taken a lot of photos in all the countries that we've been in. A few of them are on the blog when I feel inspired to post something, but it would be really fun to compile them all into some sort of a, a book with personal essays and photographs and tell a story about what it's been like to live in these places. Can you talk about the, yeah, the, I'm curious about just the, um, or whatever you want to share, like you're on the family life. Um, uh, obviously you have a son, you have a dog, a husband, and then wrestling with these assignments or <clears throat> just, you know, Hey, we have a very unique family and, communicating with your friends and family back in the States. Can you just talk about kind of the general life of like what it's like to be a diplomat in a diplomatic family? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, and um, you know, I, I, I love it when I go home because a lot of my mother's friends are very well traveled, but we tend to live in what we call high threat countries because my husband is a high threat trained diplomatic security agent. So, um, you that's know, so yeah. When he, he be, that's interesting. He's really good at his job, so he gets the toughest assignments, so to speak. Wow. Well, and so we were in Honduras before this, which um, was not a hot tourist destination because of the kidnappings and the uh, drug trafficking and the gangs and such while we were there. Um, but I would go home, and you know, everyone in Georgia says, "Oh my gosh, you laugh! It's so glamorous," and. Uh, it is, you know, there's days, there's days where we go, like two weeks ago, we went to the Italian National Day event, and it was lovely, and you walk in on a little red carpet, and they take your picture, and you have this lovely food, and there's usually live music, and the, the diplomatic events are wonderful, but that's few and far between for me as a spouse, I'm not a political officer here, 
Um, they're often doing those sorts of events, but most of it is not glamorous. A lot of is it a lot of it is that it takes me a couple hours to get to the grocery store because it's very circuitous, because of the road conditions. Um, you know, it's not America where the roads are well paved. It's really civilized. I can get to Trader Joe's and Target and, you know, the dry cleaners within an hour and be back at my house. Like I, my husband has learned not to ask the question, what did you do today? Because, you know, when you've been running federal government programs for millions of dollars, and then all you've done today is go to the grocery store as, as a, as an individual, sometimes that can be frustrating, but we, um, I love it. Every day is different. And that is what I would say. It's never routine. Every day I wake up and I leave my house, something interesting happens. And not that that can't happen in the States, but maybe I wouldn't notice it if I were in the States. You know, it's all those idiosyncratic things. I go out and there's a woman outside the grocery store and she's selling fabric and she has an interesting story. So I end up talking to her and then she has a sister who sells pineapples. And could I please just go buy a pineapple so that her child can go to school. And, you know, if you take the time to listen and you're not in such a hurry and you get out and you start really speaking to people who live here, it's, it's fascinating. It's fascinating. I, no, I love that. I There's... A little... No, that's great. I know There's that idea like system one thinking and system two thinking, um, Richard Naylor, Chicago, but basically like commuting, like if I drive into DC, it's like, I know, like, I don't even have to think about it and you're just kind of oblivious. Whereas I, I yeah, for you every day, it's gotta be like, wow, I've never been here before. It's gotta be fantastic. Like you're just constantly learning and processes information and new, um, new data. And I, for me, I've been thinking about that too, a lot, or just getting around comms and communications because it can get boring to do the same. Like if you're an expert in fraud, trade, whatever, and you're writing your, you know, 15th report on, you know, international fraud, you're like, how do I make, so how do you make this exciting? How do I make this interesting? And just the benefit of like going to a local market or going to a museum or listening to, you know, a film in a foreign language, there's some real beneficial I found for me to like, just open your eyes to the bigger world. Yes. And I feel like as guilty as I feel sometimes as a mother who's taken my child out of America, he's called a third culture kid, someone who's grown up outside of his own country and also oh, raised wow. differently than his parents were raised. You know, it's an interesting concept. It's, it's not one I coined. It's, it's out there. But, you know, third culture kids, they have this advantage of learning outside the classroom all of the time. And you know, my son doesn't any longer because he was too little to remember. But at one time he spoke Siswati Zulu, Arabic, Spanish, French. You know, he really, he's been on more airplanes than most of my friends. Um, you know, it's just a different lifestyle, but in such a cool way too. He, he really embraces diversity in a way that I'm not sure we would if we lived in the States. And I love that. I love that so much. You know, it's like a little United Nations. Even when they were little and they couldn't speak the same language, we would go to beaches and there would be a child from Italy, a child from Russia, a child from Japan and my son, and they couldn't speak to each other, but they would play for hours. And you just think, why can't adults be like this? You know? That's so positive. And I mean, obviously, you know, America is an amazing place, super interesting, but it's so vast and so huge. And, you know, um, yeah, I met somebody the other day. He's in his mid fifties and he's never left the country. And I was just, I couldn't, even, you know, I was like, and he's like, quote unquote, a successful professional. <laughs> I'm just like, are you curious about, you know, Paris? Um, I want to tell yeah, the, the idea of getting more people out. So you're probably familiar with the Meridian Institute, the Meridian International here in DC. Like they do kind of corporate diplomacy I've and heard whatnot. Of it. And um, they are actually, they're actually doing this cool program. Uh, my wife and I are hosting uh, two students. They're actually bringing um, kind of non-traditional students, college or community college kids to DC for two weeks to get them exposed to, you know, kind of diplomacy and uh, global politics. And we're hosting two kids for dinner. 
which will be fun in their 20s. We're, we're, you know, my wife, I'm in my nice. 50s and Karen's in her late 40s. We're like, you know, how do we feed 20 year olds? So we're wrestling with the menu. Um, <laughs> and then where I went to school at UNC, uh, the Keenan Flagler, the business school, part of their program to graduate, um, either graduate or undergraduate, you have to do some kind of foreign exchange. And um, just talking to people that are in that program, you're right, Tracy, they're like kids that go to UNC that have never been on a plane before and just how important it is to get out of your comfort zone. And I think there really is, we got to find a better way to get more people out of this country and whether it's informal or formal, I don't know. I think it would really help the United States. That's a, kind of a leading really question. Um, I don't know. Like there must be, the diplomatic community must talk about that too. I imagine. Right. Oh, a lot, a lot. Well, and I think um, if it's okay to mention another person that you've interviewed Ann Carpenter, I listened to her interview with you and uh, I was fascinated. I'd love to meet her in, in person one day. In fact, I said to my now, husband, Anne's amazing. Like, you, would talk- you would love Anne. Anne's amazing. You would love her. I She's said, cool. Well, I think you should start a um, Caracal Global Women's Initiative or something because you're connected <laughs> to a lot of great women. I we can chat offline about that. But um, all right, I would all right. Love to meet her. Also, as a as a wordsmith person who loves language arts, um, she used the word morass. Like if you talk to Anne, you tell her you had Tracy at the word morass. I was like, great, look at her, look at her. I love that. Um, but I'm the point I really wanted to make is that she was talking about the importance of connecting to the source. You know, I think so many people. I'm talking about goods. You know, you go into a store, whichever store it is, and you buy something. I don't think many people think about the supply chain behind that, how many countries it's touched before it got on that shelf, the economic ramifications of what you're supporting when you make that purchase. And it's something when you live in these countries and you've cut out the middleman and you are constantly buying directly from the vendor, there is something so much more rewarding about that. I don't like going to stores in America where I don't know, unless it's like, you know, DC is great, right? About support local board, you go to the markets and maybe you're down in Eastern market and you're buying tomatoes from the person that grew them. But right. in general in the States, I think that's pretty rare and not having that human connection with the person whose hands have touched it or you know, I don't want to say worse. I'm all for capitalism and trade, but, you know, going into a store and buying it and not realizing this t-shirt, you know, it was made in Vietnam from cotton that was purchased somewhere else, probably put on a spinning loom in a fourth or fifth country, the carbon footprint it took for that airplane to bring it to the store. I really, it's something that I, it's near and dear to my heart. Like when I take my son, Ramsey, he's 11. And of course, you know, he rolls his eyes, but we were in Georgia a couple summers ago <laughs> and probably I'm on some farmers uh, CCTV footage and they're like, what in the hell is this woman doing? But I pulled over my car and I got out and I said, we're going to go touch that cotton. And he was like, what? And we went and we picked one piece of cotton out of this person's field. Thank you, farmer. And I said, look, this is cotton. It had seeds in it. And I said, touch your t-shirt. And I said, that was made from that. And I could see this on his face. He had no idea. And I think we have lost so much of that um, in America. And I don't know how you bring that back other than through farmers markets, you know, but talking about on a, on a bigger scale, I don't know. It's something but- obviously I'm passionate about. Yeah, no, Tracy, I, um, so I grew up, yeah, in the industrial Midwest and the Great Lakes around Detroit, and I grew up around factories and, you know, people that, you know, bent steel in the cars and all kinds of crazy stuff. And I think about D.C., there's two plants along the Potomac, even here in Alexandria, the Torpedo Factory now is like an art center, and the other big smokestack up the river is a Ritz-Carlton, which is great. I mean, they're fantastic, but the, like, the idea of, like, listen, like, people actually had to make stuff and put it together, um, yeah, it's like those two kind of things are lacking. I don't like it's almost America's interesting because we've become so efficient at living a very comfortable life that we've lost touch with other nations, 
and even fellow Americans about they doing that stuff. You probably know that book, The Travels of a T-Shirt. It's by a Georgetown professor. If not, I'll send it to you. But it talks a lot about, yeah, the yeah. cotton comes from America. Georgia, Texas ends up, gets shipped. And then the T-shirts, you know, they end up in um, maybe Africa as well, like the whole lifespan of it. But um, no, I love it. That's good. Um, do you want to, yeah, we were chatting about, I'm curious, the diplomat. We were chatting about that offline, Netflix and whatnot, if you want to chat about that. But just about other um, creative pursuits, is, is there a mantra you have for people that you work with? Or you think about yourself? Carpe diem, I love, but is there... Um, how can we be more creative? I think people are really critical of themselves. I think you have to turn off those mind monkeys, you know, who are like saying, well, who are you to think that you're an artist or, you know, you're not good at this. You're not educated in this. All that doesn't matter. You just got to throw all that out the window, right? All of that negative self-talk and self-chatter. Uh, and allow yourself to be kind of childlike again, right? Get out some paper and a pen or some watercolors and just who cares? It doesn't have to be something that's going to go hang in a Smithsonian Museum. Just enjoy the process. And I think if you can approach it from that way, even if you don't show it to anyone else, it's just something that's just for you. And I think that's Sometimes we forget about that. We wear a lot of different hats, right? You're the federal investigator, Tracy. You're the wife, Tracy. You're the mom, Tracy. You're the diplomat, Tracy. You're the writer, Tracy. But sometimes there's just stuff I want to do that's just for me, whether that's getting up and doing some yoga or I meditate or I write in a journal. And none of that goes anywhere. I mean, it does something for me internally, but... I think just enjoy the process, the creative process. Don't be focused. You know, don't focus on the end result. I love it. This is great. As I was before we got on, I was telling you I'm not the greatest morning person. So uh, you know, at eight AM may not we're recording this eight AM East Coast time, which is does not sound that aggressive, but um this was great. I feel really empowered. I feel like I should start every Monday with a call with you. This is good. Yay. Great. Well, when you start your, your global women's group, um, I was going <laughs> to say too, I, because I'm an investigator, I like to know who I'm talking to. So I went all through your LinkedIn. I know. I can only imagine like page. all the interesting stuff, not, you know, wow. No, no, you're not to freak You're probably out. very that resourceful. Okay. No, you're very resourceful. I'm sure. No, but I, I'm, I'm interested because, uh, a couple of things I picked up on that I wanted to ask you about, and we can, we can talk about this offline too, but I wanted to know how long it took you to write your book. Always be communicating. Um, I saw that you went to a language arts museum, which, of course, being a traveler, I'm fascinated by that. I didn't know that had opened in D.C., and I can't wait to go and see it. And the other thing was one of the top voices that you follow on LinkedIn is a woman I had not heard of, and I'm so glad to be virtually introduced to, Liz Fossling. And I see that she's a storyteller and a creative, and I want Eventually, if I can make it up to D.C. somehow, I don't know if I will this summer, but I would love to meet her. She sounds fascinating. Maybe we can have a video chat with Liz Fossling one day. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, she uh, needs yeah. to be in the Caracal women's group with me and, well, and Ann Carpenter. Um, <laughs> the fact that you can pronounce Caracal and know what it is is a huge – I love was. Speaking, of, this is interesting. Like, I'll answer these questions. Yeah. So the the name Caracal, like, I wanted when I launched this communications firm, something um, interesting. I wanted someone to see. I wanted an animal, and um, I myself had never heard of a Caracal, and then I just love the name. And you know, it's a cat, and to me, it like kind of punches above its weight. And it leaps, and it's a bit you know mysterious, and it has the big ears, you know, listening. So I think with comms for me, what's really important is. Communication is like a state of mind, but it's really like taking in a lot of data to like know what's going on. Like it's very, you can just spout off and say whatever you want. But to me, successful communications is understanding like the culture, the people listening, taking in data, formulating your own ideas. So that was that. Um, yeah, the book project is interesting. So I've been an adjunct professor at GW at George Washington University, and I have all these syllabus. And um, 
So the idea is to like, it's not, it's going to be in a book in the traditional sense. Like, I don't know, it's not going to be like war and peace, but the idea is like going to be much more interactive and taking like all these lectures and forming into the book. And I'm going to drop that in uh, November, probably November, that second week in November. Um, awesome. Yeah. Planet Word. You would love Tracy. Like I didn't know it either. It was like, it's Franklin school. It's right on McPherson square. Uh, or is it, it's one of the squares, like 13th and K. It's that old school, and uh, it's a museum dedicated to language, to the English language. I was like, it's an amazing, cool. it's the super cool museum, amazing layout, and um, yeah, I think that's what I like. Live in the city, and you're like, don't even know what's happening. It's pretty funny, but I think you would love that museum. It's super cool. And then Liz, like I said, I think even I just find like I don't like want to be connected to interesting people, and. Um, getting back to the comms idea too and like being a professional and I don't know, like my vibe in DC is like, I meet a lot of smart, interesting people, but they're really, it can be a bit dull because it's a really focused on kind of DC. And um, even though I live here, my job's always been to kind of like organize people outside the outside DC and like shape policy or work on campaigns and get outside the beltway, so to speak. And I think when I work with my clients too, I have this idea of like high, low, and, you know, you need to like get exposure to other ideas. It can't just be, you can't just be the best in this narrow. You should learn from other people and that'll help you do your job better. So um, I think Liz is, you know, one of those people I was like, oh, she's interesting. I need to uh, have her in my life in some way informally or, you know, via LinkedIn or something like that. Yeah, definitely. Well, and I, I watched a couple of her YouTube videos and I was like, all right. Yeah. She's, she's, talking my language you know she's all about emotions in the workplace and clearly a woman probably who's often been in the room um in a male dominated field I don't know that for sure but I sort of got that impression from what I was watching and that's something I'm very familiar with I'm glad to say that in 2023 we've come a long way at least in the United States for for gender equality but she seems like um I don't know a, a really inspiring woman I'd like to speak to in person well, I think, um, yeah, as we wrap up, I think this was really great. And I think the testament that we're doing this, you know, conversation across, you know, vast oceans and we're depending on all kinds of crazy technology, all kinds of wires, copper, you know, it's like fantastic, right? We should thank the miners and, you know, everybody who figured out this technology to make this happen. So it was really great. Isn't it incredible to think that, do you know that I'm, um, our house here where I'm sitting is 25 miles from the equator. Isn't that super cool? I think that it sounds super as a, humid. As someone, That's what that sounds like. <laughs> well, it's really hot, but I got good training growing up in Georgia. It's about the same heat and humidity. Um, and what's that's cool. Really 25 cool miles to the equator. That's so cool. Wow. Yeah. And when you go out on the beaches here, there is some pollution in the city. But when you go further north, the beaches are stunning and they're otherworldly with all these um, chunks of driftwood that are just gorgeous, but really like you could be on Jekyll Island, you know, I don't know if you know coastal Georgia and, and the, I know, yeah, I know Jekyll Island. yeah, that's a good very reference. Well, that's but good. It, yeah. But I mean, like there are places where I go here and because of the weather and because of some of the scenery, I'm like, Oh, this really, this feels good to me. It feels, feels comfortable. There's a lot, believe me, that doesn't feel like Georgia, but, um, yeah, it's it's really a blessing. We feel we feel really fortunate to be able to live this lifestyle, and um, it's not always glamorous. And we, as we talked about on the Diplomat, um, you know, Carrie Russell's so great, and it's been well researched. But she doesn't get late to work because there's animals in the road, or her generator doesn't kick on, or you know, there's impromptu flooding, or she forgot to take her malaria medicine. There's a lot of realities that um, you know. May, are not factored into the show, but um, yeah, no, it's an interesting lifestyle. We feel really grateful to be doing this, but I appreciate you taking the time to to speak to me this morning. I'm inspired by what you're doing and I'm always interested by who you interview. So thanks. Thanks for doing that. No, this is great. Thanks for being the time. And like I said, I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Hope we can do it again soon. Yeah, me too. Thanks so much, Mark. Bonjour. Oh, wait. No, au revoir. Gosh, my French is so poor. Au revoir. <laughs> à la prochaine. See you next time.